Good afternoon. I'm sure uh, most of you must now be aware of the complex challenges that we're currently facing as a nation. To the, to the point that the concept of a nation as a social construct maybe doesn't make sense anymore. And it's at times like these that I prefer to think of, of a city as a more logical way of collecting a population where there's no tangible borders. There's a, a border is more of a gradient than a line where the notion of economy, when even in crisis, is something that's visible and understandable and where space plays an incredibly important role in helping to engage and overcome difference. So, instead of standing here today as a South African, I'd like to introduce myself as a citizen of the Republic of Johannesburg. <laughs> it's actually the real, that's really the flag of Joburg, in case any of you didn't know. So, um, the Republic of Johannesburg is about the same size of, as New Zealand. We buy five million people. And we've got this, a similar size economy and, and, and corruption, no doubt to a small uh, developing country like Ecuador. My city was built on non-renewable mine resources and cheap native labor, and this, combined with the rigors of spatial apartheid, resulted in an extraordinary downtown, which reached its peak in the mid-1970s. And, uh, you know, many people refer to their cities as the Paris of, the, of wherever, or the New York of wherever, but Joburg really was the New York of Africa. We had Skidmore Owings and Merrill designing skyscrapers for us but it was reserved for whites only, and um, due to crumbling apartheid law after, in the mid-1970s began its decline. To oversimplify uh, architectural discourse in Joburg, we can identify two camps. One where we simply started a whole new city from scratch with the illusion that the CBD was a transferable asset. Here we think we're as, as tough as we were in the 1970s, we're definitely not as tough as we were in the 1970s. Or we, we work with what we've got, with the existing city, and we try to inhabit it in, uh, using whatever means necessary. So in the new city where there is only new, in the existing city where, by virtue of the fact that we cannot possibly afford to build like we did in the past, change is visible as a, a new layer. And um, it's this concept of additions and alterations to an existing city that, that inspires me quite a lot. One of my first projects which, which speaks to this idea is a mobile bread shop that I designed for a, a, um, well, in the apartheid-era township of Alexandra. Here, a young entrepreneur recognized the need for an innovative way to deliver bread in the very narrow alleyways of this informal metropolis. The, the project was built with local laborers using steel, and it um, taught me the viability of steel construction, and also about this concept of lightness and temporality that could inspire a new future for the city. Another project which speaks to this idea, also in an apartheid-era township called Quatema, this time's 50 k's out of the city, was the restructuring of a billboard to create a space underneath. And here, this project taught me a little bit about um, questioning this notion of infrastructure and of all the many missed opportunities we have for the creation of public space in the delivery of so-called first, first world services in our new democracy. I started Local Studio in 2012. We're, we're located in a, a, a historical suburb of Johannesburg called Brixton. We operate out of an old corner shop that used to be a Chinese restaurant. It still smells like Chinese food. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're a team of 10 people. Uh, there's only a few on, on, this, on the screen at, at, uh, right now. And uh, I can't possibly begin, or say, just begin to say that I'm at a stage in my career where I'm able to pick and choose work but uh, we have a number of themes have started to emerge in our practice that are, that, that are quite, uh, quite clear and distinct. One of them is this idea of heritage. Now, the, da the downtown Joburg, historical downtown Joburg, may not be the, the location of choice for corporates, but there's still a vibrant repurposing going on. Most prevalent is the conversion of old office buildings into, into housing, affordable housing. So we're now at, the, at, a, at a very special point in time where the average working class resident of our city earning, let's say, between $100 and $200 a month has a, has a choice of well-located, well-serviced and, and safe housing options. And it's a, a lot more than can be said for many of the other cities in, in, in South Africa. And um, changes, 
to buildings mostly occur on the interior, but every now and then they manifest themselves in the public realm uh, in these kind of emergency responses to this new condition. Now, most of the time, these, these responses are negative, as what you can see on the screen, in this kind of uh, response to, to this, these new security needs. But every now and then, they, there's something positive that pops up and something where there's a, a clearly new attempt to soften the pedestrian experience and, um, and respond to this new, new notion of neighborhood. And it, it's, it's these mushroom-like accretions that are clearly visible um, and an old and a new that have begun to point me in, in, in the direction of my practice. My, our first major built work in Johannesburg was the Outreach Foundation Community Centre. This is a, a community centre dedicated to a, 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 a variety of, of forms of, of outreach to youth in Hillbrow, which is not, a notoriously poor and, and troubled sub, uh, suburb of, of the inner city of Johannesburg. The building is the first new piece of social infrastructure to have been built in the area in, uh, since the 1970s. The building shares a site or a, a city block with one of the oldest buildings in Hillbrow, which is a, an old Lutheran church, about 110 years old, and administratively it's still connected to the Lutheran church. The actual building site is the staggered rooftop of an unfinished community hall, which was built as part of the German consulate, which also occupied that's the stand at, 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 at some point in history. And the building's three primary functions, which are all focused around this idea of outreach, are staggered over the three levels of the site. So at entry level, we have an IT center teaching computer skills to youth. And the, the middle floor is a dance studio, but also a space for music practice. And the top floor um, is flexible offices and meeting spaces that are, that are, are accessible to everybody in the community. All of these spaces feed onto a, a communal, semi-public roof garden. And the building presents its primary program, which is this dance studio, to the main street. This is Twist Street. It's one of the busiest pedestrian streets in Hillbrow, through a 12-meter window, which is visible you know, uh, when walking by. And the primary program of the building being dance, uh, this, this, this space has become a location of choice for visiting dance groups to South Africa, to Johannesburg, who want to do some kind of outreach. So recently we had Alvin Ailey, for example, teaching a class to, to these, these Hillbrow youth who all, you know, obviously all live in the area. And Cube, the Cuban Ballet also is a regular outreach uh, participant. Uh, I like to think of the building as a small piece of urban design where the circulation is imagined as a little street that, that ferries people from ground floor up to the, to the roof garden. And this, this, past, this main little street doubles up as a community art gallery where uh, this, is, this is the work of a local NGO called Boitumela, Boitumela that do beautiful tapestries, storytelling tapestries. And the street takes us onto the, the roof garden. Now this roof garden was not funded as part of the original National Lottery grant. We actually raised money for this garden by going to affordable housing companies in the area, and they agreed to fund the thing, the thing on, the, on the basis that um, their tenants would be able to use the space uh, for, for events. So we've got quite a participatory kind of space going on now. And this, uh, the space performs quite well. And, and recently, this was a visiting Russian ballet um, performed in a bridged version of Swan Lake on the, on the rooftop. A little cheeky addition to the, to the brief was the construction of a double-story or double-leveled steel bench across the road on Twist Street. And this was fun actually funded as part of the Design in Daba Your Street campaign. And um, it allows, you know, the, as I mentioned, this is one of the busiest pedestrian thoroughfares. So it, it's when people are, are kind of carrying a lot of shopping and they want to rest, they can sit on the, sit on the bench and take in view, or sit on the bench like this and, and take in views like this. Uh, a housing company in the area uh, caught, this building caught their eye and they, and they approached us to design their service center, so the space where, where, where potential tenants would come in and apply for housing. And um, the, the site, the proposed building site, was the, fifth, was the rooftop of a 15-story 15, 15 heritage building that they owned. So like with the Outreach Foundation building, we imagined this new structure as, a, as this, this parasite growing on the, on, the, on the roof of this building. It's, uh, it's quite an extraordinary brief because usually these kind of service centers where you go and apply for housing are relegated to like a ground floor uh, shop, dodgy shop space. But here when tenants are coming, this, and this is to, you know, this is affordable housing tenants coming to, to get credit checks done. They can enjoy panoramic views of, of Johannesburg in quite an, a, a beautiful space. 
the next theme I'd like to talk about today, which, which, which we've, we've been exploring in our practice, is this, this very general idea of public space. Now, those of you who are familiar with, with our apartheid laws will, will know that um, the laws try to restrict as far as possible the public gatherings of any kind. So generally public gatherings were banned, and this had a massive impact on, on the, the way we built, uh, the way architecture kind of panned out in township spaces. So you know, the, 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 mean, the meanest of, of, these, of these kind of results was um, that m the majority of schools, and those of you who went to, ta went to township schools will know this, the majority of schools in townships don't have school halls because there were spaces where uh, more than 1,000 people could gather and, and have a meeting that could potentially uh, you know, turn into a revolution. So uh, where today our, our, our mismanaged education department is unable to, uh, to still unable to, to develop, deliver school, uh, school halls, you end up with, with outdoor assemblies like this. And this, this happens, I mean, I've visited many, many schools, predominantly in Johannesburg, where this is the case. Our client is a private social enterprise called the African School for Excellence, and they have this very ambitious uh, vision of putting a million children in, school, in, in, in this kind of affordable private schooling in the next 15 years. So we were appointed to do their very first school. It was a, a project in Sakane. This was going to be for 600 pupils. We had a budget of $700,000, so in RAND terms, that's about $12 million. And um, the square footage, if we were to include a school hall, which was now so important, was about 55,000 square feet or 5,000 square meters. Now, that's, that's a really cheap budget. That's $13 a square foot in RAND terms, 2,400 Rand a square meter. You, you don't build RDP housing for that budget. So we imagined, we, we, let, we said, let's get the classroom spaces right first. And we, we, we developed a system of, of, of classroom blocks arranged around a, a vast central courtyard and said, well, let's start with the, getting the classrooms built to spec and, and, and well insulated and, uh, and, and, and the whole space more as an outdoor space. And then we, we managed to find the budget within that, within that budget, find the money to float a lightweight steel roof over this, what, what is essentially an outdoor courtyard space. And, we, and it really is an outdoor space in the sense that the floor is not a, it's not a traditionally cast concrete floor. The floor is actually paving on compacted earth, but it, it does its job. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to mention earlier when talking about the majority of school halls in, in, in townships don't have, uh, schools in townships don't have halls. This is, I mean, this, this, a hall can be an income generator for a school. And, um, you know, when, when, when after hours, when, these, when, when there's no school time, you know, it should be a space that, that, uh, that can be rented for weddings and things like that. And the school, and the school hall already does, performs this kind of function. It's actually the biggest building in the community. The, the, obviously, the primary purpose of the school is to, mo to promote ASE's fantastic education model, which, which manages to reduce costs by, by, by uh, moving students between instructional learning, which is basically with, with a teacher, between self-study, where you're learning on your own with an iPad, and, with, and, and to partner learning, where you sit with your friend and learn, and the school supports all of those kind of ideas. Um, this, this, the main urban intervention of the school is the extrusion of the east elevation outwards, and this, this sort of welcomes the sunrise and also welcomes Takane into the building. It's, it's visible from very far away. The final... Uh, concept I wanted to talk about and the theme that I've been looking at in our, in our practice is this idea of desegregation. Now, um, those of you who are familiar with apartheid era planning will know the diagram that's up on stage. This is the, the, the ideal apartheid city and, and the majority of large cities in our, in, in our country have been designed according to this diagram or retrofitted according to this diagram. Now, applied to a map of Johannesburg, you'll see that what was really so, I, I hate to say the word, but clever about apartheid planning was that they used whatever uh, natural features and, natural and infrastructure the city had as a, as, the, as, as, a, as a buffer zone. And in this image, you can see clearly that the very reason for our existence, the mining belt, is the main buffer zone between the white areas and the black areas. And that big black uh, area at the bottom is, is Soweto. And um, the same could probably be said for Cape Town. The very reason for Cape Town's existence, which is the mountain, is, is a buffer zone between the inner city and, 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 uh, and non-white townships. So, but there is hope, and the, our, you know, we have this, we have quite a, quite a fantastic policy called Corridors of Freedom, 
which is looking to knit this, the apartheid city back together by, use, by the use of public transport and non-motorized transport systems. And um, this, this can be seen in, in the, the current and extended routes of the car train and the rear via bus rapid transport system, as well as various cycle paths and pedestrian walkways that have been proposed. Now, we were, we were appointed to look at uh, a specific portion of, of one of the corridors of freedom called the, it's the historical western areas of Johannesburg. Now, this area is, is, is quite famous historically for housing, or previously housing, an area called Sophia Town, which was one of the only places that non-white South Africans could own land close to the inner city, and this was before, the apart before high apartheid took over in 1948. After 1948, um, as many of you may be aware, so that Safaritan was completely demolished and, um, and, uh, and rebuilt as a, as a whites-only suburb called Triumph. Now, the area, the, the, the broader urban area, what, we, what, what, what is relatively unknown is that the broader urban area is, was subject to some of the most ruthless acts of the Group Areas Act, and it was erased and rebuilt many times over its 100-year history. So we get to a point today where um, what, what you have is a, a, a white, uh, predominantly white middle-class area called Sophia Town up north, divided by a buffer strip of sports field and industrial buildings from uh, the, the very poor coloured township of Westbury. Our project quite simply involved the creation of a path that connected, that connected these two previously disconnected areas. The path was, was, would include, um, was also, uh, apart from, from, a, from a space for walking and cycling, was opportunities for placemaking along the way, like bollards and benches. And, uh, and, and moments for, 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 you know, for placemaking, trees, we made use of trees as well. One of my, most, uh, my, one of my favorite points of this, uh, uh, of this NMT route was where it crosses an existing dam called the West Dean Dam in, in Johannesburg. And um, you know, this, is the, this was the current state, or it's the state of the dam before we came along. And it was a, it's essentially a walkway that's about 900 millimeters wide and, and then the roadway. And, you know, we dic as urban designers, we quite dictate. We often are dictated to by engineers about what must happen, and they kind of see us most more as like uh, as paving experts. And so the engineers, the engineers said to me, "Yeah, the, the, you can't change anything. The walkway is staying 900 millimeters. The cyclists are going on the road. We're going to make a back-to-back -back curb there, and that's it. No, no changes." And we we fought quite hard, and we said, "Well, you know, when you're going over water." You don't necessarily want to be going too fast. You want to take in the view. You want to pause. And we, and we convinced them to combine this very narrow 900 mil walkway with, uh, with the cycle path to create a promenade. We even stole some space from the sidewalk across the road. And the resultant is a, it's a five meter uh, promenade now that, that crosses over this dam. Now, this may seem like a logical sort of thing to most of the Europeans sitting in the audience. Oh, well, that happens all the time. This is a big win in Johannesburg. We don't know, that, we don't know what public space really is. And um, I was, you know, as I mentioned, we, you know, the, the most, most of what we do is paving. And, um, you know, this was previously a, <laughs> this was previously quite a muddy sidewalk. And, uh, and we, we've had a, a terrible heat wave of the last few months. And I was quite, quite uh, excited to see how um, the space facilitated swimming as, as well as walking and cycling. Now, I wasn't going to show the last this last project until, until very recently, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, we've been working over the last five years on a community center project um, that's strategically located on this, this NMT route that, I, that I've been mentioning. The Trevor Huddleston Memorial Center is a, an NGO that's named after a very famous anti-apartheid anti -apartheid cleric called Father Trevor Huddleston. He arrived um, to, to, to essentially establish or, or, or kind of grow an Anglican church situated in Sophia Town. And invariably, his role became one of, of outreach, and, um, and he had a, a big passion for the youth. And, uh, you know, many, he, was one of, he was probably the most famous person in Sophia Town for the incredibly good work he did in social development. Now, the, the NGO has been operating for about 15 years, and, um, and they've been you know, continuing the good work of Father Trevor Huddleston. They had, they had been operating from another site in Sophia Town, but when we, when we met them, they'd, they'd, they'd essentially uh, located a site that was next door to the picture you see on the right. The, the picture you see on the right is one of the only buildings that was, that was left um, after, the, after the demolition of, the, of Sophia Town. It's the A.B. Umar House, and he was one of the first presidents of the ANC. So we, so we were given the job to look at a, a project which, which, would com, which would create a micro-precinct and combine the, the A.B. Umar House as a, as a heritage museum 
and this new community center, which is basically a space that could collect and, and house all the social development functions that the Trevor Huddleston Memorial Center uh, would use. So we imagine that the project is a, as a little precinct um, with, with, you know, with this kind of flexible yard in, in, in between. The building, the new building itself, had quite a specific brief. We, we had to, by, it had to be by day, it had to house a coffee shop, a training or practice studios, and a training center, and by night you'd have, we'd have to have these massive walls that slid away, and it, and it would, needed to support uh, a theater or a, or a venue capable of housing 200 people and up. Now, the, um, the, we made use of three key urban typologies to, uh, you know, looking at the history of Sophia Town to in, in, in developing this building's form, the stoop, the semi-public yard, and the, and the corner shop, try to reappropriate these ideas that have been, had been lost in the demolitions. Um, a part, another, another part of the, of the brief called for, I mean, we, we, we're reaching the 50 year, and we are currently in the, year, in the 50th anniversary of the forced removals of Sophia Town, so the client asked that we somehow, in the project, commemorate this idea and, and, and remember, remember the removals. And so we conceptualized a, this, a sunscreen that would wrap around the north and east facades of the building, but the sunscreen, while obviously performing a climactic function, would support an uh, old map of the fire town. And this was, uh, could be a space where former residents, forcibly removed residents, could hang a plaque and look, and, and, uh, in the location of their former homes. Now, we, the building reached completion in October last year, and um, as you can see, it's, it's, it's incomplete. It was incomplete. Um, it, it still functions fairly well. I mean, the, the center, you know, the space is quite, although it's quite sparse, the NGO is quite, as, as many are quite poor, but the, but the space functions, the internal functions function well. Um, the building can host the, its training and studio functions, its coffee shop, as well as its events and performance space by night. But from the outside, it's clearly unfinished. You know, uh, I think Adolf Lewis would be turning in his grave if you heard me say this right now, but it's, it's kind of like a, it's like a cake without, without its icing on. Um, but we as, we as the architects, our, our client had lost hope, and we as the, we as the architects, we, had, we launched a variety of fundraising campaigns to try and uh, get this thing going, and we, I mean, it was Indiegogo and, and, what, and uh, Kickstarter, but, but none, none were, were too successful. We even, uh, we even met with this guy and asked him for, for some money. <laughs> but he, uh, he, he, I think he had his own security upgrades to worry about. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, literally three weeks ago, I, I, re I received a call from Ravi Naidu. And he, and he, I mean, I'd mentioned, we'd, when we'd met two months ago, I'd mentioned to him you know, that I, we were in, in distress about this, this, this project and it was actually not, not finished. And then he called me three, week, three weeks ago and he said, uh, Thomas, I'm putting money in your account tomorrow. Uh, you've got to finish the project. It's got to be finished by Indaba. You've got to launch it at Indaba. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's with huge thanks to Design Indaba and in partnership with Nedbank that um, I'm very, very happy to, to present the, the Sophia Town Memorial screen to you today. Before I invite you to join me up on the balcony for the unveiling ceremony of the Sofata and Heritage Wall, I need to acknowledge the following. Design in Dhaba and NetBank who have generously funded the Heritage Wall, local studio, our amazing architects, who have worked tirelessly to get the installation of the wall ready for today. They only had two weeks to achieve this. I declare the Safar Town Heritage Wall unveiled. Former residents who have generously given time to help us preserve and share the legacy of Safar Town, 
Without you, none of this would have been possible. Please consider this your second home. You and your families are always welcome. You were present when we dug the foundations of this building, and now we celebrate with you as we look forward. <laughs>